This is the Empower Podcast. Released April 5th, 2020. Episode 487, sponsored by Screaming Circuits. An interview with Carrie Sharpglass. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Kerry Sharfglass, a human on planet Earth. One of the 7 billion plus or so. How are you doing, Kerry? <laughs> Good. I'm doing okay, given the circumstances. The inside of my house looks really nice. You know, I was thinking about it today. So we were recording a little bit later than, uh, you know, you were nice to do this kind of last minute. And I was thinking, I could pretty much email anyone right now and be like, hey, are you available for the Amp Hour? And they'd have that, like, if they say no, I'm like, who are, you, who are you kidding here come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true uh yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna like pack the, the the week with interviews you're the first of many apparently so um it's good to talk to you uh you and i yeah, know I each other from too. uh meetups and badge life stuff and lots of things i guess right yeah i guess so i think you were originally the guy in the keycat hat who i had seen on that cool youtube thing who had taught me keycat 4 <laughs> yeah, great, great. Yeah. And uh, that was as you were getting into building badges. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I first tried, what was it? it wasn't Circuit Maker. It was one of the funny online ones, which was really great, mm. except uh, I would work on my commute and the train would go through tunnels and sometimes <laughs> things would sort of disappear. And so uh -huh. it became clear that I needed a different solution and, and thus ended up at KiCad. Right, and you. right. That's... <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. Well, it, everybody finds their way to KiCad in one way or another, and trains are one of them, I guess. So, so yeah, that's I good. So. Yeah, maybe it was Upverter or something. I don't know. Like the online ones were, it depends on what yeah. it was. So it was Upverter. Yeah. Okay. It was generally fairly pleasant to use, except for that one caveat. Well, yeah, that is that is the tough thing with the, the network connection ones. Yeah. So you've given a couple talks on badges, and we'll link all those in. But what is what is the badge that you worked on? This is for DEF CON, right? Yeah, it's been at this point, it's been a little while since I've done much meaningful badge stuff. The last one and the one that I guess introduced me to the most people was the third version of the Dragonfly badge. So lots of lots of LEDs and some infrared communication and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And it was a pretty tight uh, geometry. So like, maybe you could explain what it kind of what the specs were on that thing. Right. I guess that, that description is not enormously useful if you haven't seen one. And this is a radio show, so uh, <laughs> visual visual aids are not very helpful. Yep. Yep. It, let's see, so it is an object, sort of an object from a book called The Diamond Age, which mm, great now book. that I'm thinking I, that's about a, it, That's on really my reread re -read. list. Yeah, I got to get back to that. Yeah, definitely. So at one point, some of the characters go to a party and they notice at the party that people are wearing these cloisonne dragonfly pins and they're changing colors. And then in the context of the book, there's nanomachines and mind control kind of and all sorts of other things that go on, which um, parts that are harder to source from DigiKey. And so we're not included in the DEF CON badge. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are limits to their amazing selection. So the badge does kind of that. So it is covered in RGB LEDs and they... They beacon periodically in infrared, and so when they're alone, they just do random random color fading, and when they notice that they're near each other, they sort of all, they synchronize a clock, the clock that they derive their animations from, and then the animations switch progressively from totally random to a coordinated pattern, and they all coordinate the same pattern at the same time. So if you, it's basically designed for, you know, if you're standing around in a circle talking to people and you talk for a few minutes, eventually they'll all be totally synchronized. And then when you walk away from each other, they'll kind of spin back out into random fading. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. And yeah, and so this was, yeah, this is your, I mean, you were doing firmware for a long time and then this was kind of your entry into hardware. Is that right? Or doing more like personalized hardware? I think that's accurate. In college, I had some, my degree was, I guess, about one third EE and two thirds computer science, but unfortunately, the one third EE was the the boring part, or rather, all the fundamental stuff up until the point where it required creativity, and then that was where that segment of coursework ended, and I ended up doing more computer science stuff. So mm -hmm. I had been exposed to doing PCB design and things, but hadn't really hadn't actually used it in the real world. And the way my brain works, if I don't use it, I lose it. So it was effectively my my reintroduction to into all yeah. those things. There were, I guess, three, that was the one 
the one that they were are the most of was the third version. The first one was very like <laughs> back alley is the wrong word, but um, <laughs> low budget, <laughs> very rough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, low low yield, low volume. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what some of the so like I said, we'll link at some of the talks you've given. You've given a Supercon talk about this. You've given a, a HDDG talk about it, I believe. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that some of that stuff was kind of like that was kind of like good small scale manufacturing type of discussion. You know, I, I think a lot of people, myself included, I got, for a while I was tuning stuff out with like Badge Life. I was like, ah, what is you know, like what is this stuff? And I think it was actually your talk and Whitney, who was also giving a talk at that mm-hmm. same HDDG. It's like, oh, okay, actually, actually, this is working on hardware for fun, right? This is just working on art projects that are happen to be electronics, and it's for mm-hmm. fun, and there's actual real-world challenges and all those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was what I, I – I guess I did it the first time because I had gone to DEF CON for a long time, and with my group of friends, we talked about, I think, since the first year, boy, how cool would it be to build one of these things? And eventually kind of decided, well, we could actually – there's like nothing preventing us from doing that besides <laughs> right. actually like doing money it. and time and programming right you know? <laughs> right yeah it's easy there's infinite amounts of those so that's not a problem you just turn the crank and there there it is yeah oh, perfect um, right right what are we even <laughs> talking about here is like electronics just snap your fingers it's done you know right yeah done i'm imagining the easy eda logo <laughs> or the uh shoot not easy eda oh that's embarrassing snap eda probably yep it was snap eda wow yeah, that, yeah it's yeah. in the name it's in the name yep <laughs> it's in the name <laughs> Hello, Natasha. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, right, right. So the first version was super rough. The second version I built about a hundred of, and the first one introduced me to a bunch of people. The second one introduced me to a bunch more people, and then I sort of started looking at it as a way to practice small scale manufacturing cottage hardware type stuff. At the time, yeah. I was working at an engineering consulting company full time, and so I I had sort of sequential exposure to a bunch of startups and large companies and, and all sorts of organizations building hardware. So I had thought in the in that sort of professional context about the business realities of building hardware and how you deal with factories and, and things like that, though I, I'm primarily a firmware engineer. So this was an interesting and relatively lower stakes way for me to kind of play with what it would take to actually build. I don't, I certainly don't want to overstate my my level of expertise here. So, so we'll say, um, build a product, build a hardware product lightly, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 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 That That's cool. I mean, like, I think, um, so I was just part of a, a conversation that I, I linked on the subreddit about yesterday and we were talking, uh, with former guests, Zach from Bantam tools and Nadia peak and another guy, Ben, and we were, t- uh, Nadia brought up this thing called like, uh, it was like a, it is a workshop they do is I think it was part of MIT when she was there. And but it was, sounded like it was like war games for manufacturing, and it sounds like you're kind of talking about that same thing for like small scale manufacturing. This is the thing we were talking about was kind of like war games for like large scale manufacturing. Like how do you huh. actually? It was like you could only talk to. It was such a crazy idea. You could only talk to the different groups that you had, right? So like one one you, you have a group of thirty people. Ten people are design. Ten people are manufacturing. Ten people are logistics. You could only have one half hour meeting a day or something like that, and you had three huh. days to like get everything done. And like it just blew my mind of like, oh wow, like that could be something that you would at least empathize with the process or in or the best case scenario, you actually like optimize. You're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't write an email that's three pages long to try and do this thing. I should do better <laughs> documentation. You know, like all of these other things that like anyone who's been doing hardware and manufacturing and all the, the things that are shitty about the process, you know, like, <laughs> but like trying to actually practice that up front so that you kind of optimize your real world processes around it you know so it sounds like you were doing that same kind of thing you were you're basically a wargaming small scale hardware manufacturing yeah i guess so boy that sounds really fun actually and very uh very shelter in place friendly to organize a (laughs) a remote distributed hardware manufacturing war games yeah 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 and it's um yeah i mean so what did you learn from it i guess what is what is you know i say war games but at the end of the day you did it anyway so it was it was a real thing you know it's not like it was for all for not it was like you actually were making and selling these things so what did you learn mm-hmm. from that that's hmm, let me see if i can how much how many of my uh bullet points i can reload into my brain <laughs> uh i guess i feel like the most useful things were meta things because it's not yeah that's what's surprising though usually too right i mean it's like oh i didn't think that was gonna be a, be a problem you know <laughs> yeah i guess that's i guess that's true so maybe foolish things like, well, I guess, <laughs> foolish, not foolish, 
uh, over communicating with your vendors, communicating as clearly as possible in a way that survives, you know, one email exchange a day. So yeah, photos yeah. and big red arrows and boxes and diagrams describing the orientation of the component because they don't seem to get it and you want to make sure they really get it with this email. <laughs> and did they? Uh, they did. That, that was yeah. that ended up being the answer was was like verbal descriptions that are getting translated both ways don't work super well, but mm -hmm. photos of actual units with things in the actual orientation and big colorful illustrations are very helpful and uh, yeah. without language barrier. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's yeah, there's a mark on a diode is pretty when you take a photo of it, <laughs> it's here and here. It's very Make clear. sure this lines yeah. up with that, right? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. I definitely didn't wasn't dealing with any anything anywhere near the volumes or complexity where I was worried about optimizing for like acid traps in my PCB design and stuff like that. That like right. that the, the, I didn't have any kind of real real reliability stuff that I was thinking mm -hmm. about because my volumes were all in the hundreds or lower. Yeah. I think well some of that actually points to the uh, the economics of it though too, right? So you have to make sure you're pricing yourself properly and that's mm -hmm. I think something that a lot of people who are doing small scale hardware they don't think about until later then they're like, oh, maybe 20% margin at the offset was a bad idea <laughs> after <laughs> I had 80% yield, you know, or something like that. It's like <laughs> economics right. or thing, you know? Right. Yeah. I think that was another lesson is all the different things that you use profit for. So I guess it's probably important to say that it's everyone does does things like this for different reasons and it's important to identify i found that it's important to identify the reasons why you're doing the thing and then optimize mm -hmm. for those reasons so i was doing it as a learning experience about building hardware in a way that i was guessing would be economically sustainable so mm -hmm. i was interested in figuring out how to optimize the cost of the unit so it generated enough profit to cover different sorts of risks in case my yield was really low or I couldn't get a component and I had to I ended up like risk buying something I couldn't use or let's see I guess yield lots of different ways of phrasing yield yeah, right right <laughs> this part broke this part broke this part broke <laughs> <laughs> right yeah scrap this scrap that yeah yeah, yeah, it's true. And I th and then I think at the end of the day, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't actually put into the calculation, like, like you know, I was adjacent to the badge life thing. I tried making my own and it didn't work out. But like the people that were adjacent to it, they're like, oh, wow, you made $50,000 for this thing. It's, it's Some people were like, yeah, but I spent 500 hours on that, you know, or I spent... <laughs> a thousand hours on that or you know it, it's like it, and then there was five people on my team so we got what like a ten dollars an hour you know it's like right okay uh yeah right. that maybe isn't you know the the thing that you want to base your 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 livelihood on but uh it yes there was money yes there was money and that's kind of like right that's the end thing it's like yes there was money some people make some money but a lot more spend money spend their time and don't make much money from it so right Right. And I mean, again, I think it depends a lot on what your goal is. If your goal is to produce uh, really wonderful art pieces that don't, and you're not interested in building it as a sustainable business, you're interested, I mean, everyone is interested in, in you know, low financial risk, I guess. So I don't, yeah, I don't mean yeah. to understate that too much. Then you're probably not as interested in making sure that you hammer a few more quarters out of your bomb cost because right. you're trying to increase the profit margin. You're probably more interested in producing maybe something that's more polished or has more features or, you know, who knows, depending on what you, what yeah. you want to do. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of people are learning from it too. And that's why, I mean, with the, my small experiment with it too, was basically, I think it's this great opportunity to, you know, push yourself. It's a reason to learn things. You know, I think that's yeah. always, especially, you know, okay, we're in a time of quarantine. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're sitting inside right now and you're like, oh, I could learn anything, but why should I? It's like, man, if you have a project though, like the people that are working towards, ventilators or whatever they're you know working on mm -hmm. there's a lot more learning happening when you have that end goal and you mm -hmm. ha you had that so that's great yeah definitely <laughs> end, end goals and hard constraints because yeah, you can't right. you cannot change when defcon starts <laughs> you, that's right or whatever the event is you must whatever whatever you're ready with at that time is what you get so that's right. prepare <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh other things you learned before we move on from this i mean what else did you uh um uh, like on the hardware side, did you learn anything particular, or you, I guess even pushing back into the firmware side, which is your your expertise? Did you learn anything surprising there? I I keep meaning to write this up in some context, and I I haven't done it yet. But the product, basically the product, 
the the badges feature effectively was RGB LEDs. So that almost all of the design effort and software effort went into supporting that in one way or another. Uh, mm. it, it turns out the infrared time synchronization stuff, you can make it really complicated, but that is the path towards failure. It, it turns out the way to do it is actually really dead simple. So kind of the thing that's left is, is all the LED things. So mm. I ended up trying to remember the numbers. 48. <laughs> so. So. 48, but I guess times three, right? Because they're tricolor, right? They're multiple. Right. So I, I ended up deciding I was very wary of the problems that, that I've had and that other people have had soldering the various controller integrated LEDs. So I ended up choosing to go with the totally dumb, separate, controller-free uh, RGB LEDs. So so the 48, three channels each. Yeah. So the the whole unit ended up being maybe like a five centimeter square, give or take. And the LEDs uh -huh. were kind of arranged on the top in a, in a particular pattern. So as I was routing, I started with a four layer board and I got, I think maybe 10 something hours into routing it. And I eventually kind of just hit a wall and it was not possible for me to go. It was, I, I rapidly tailed off in, in my progress per, per yeah. minute of time routing. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up, it's good to figure that out sooner than later, though, too, right? I mean, like, that's better than being, like, getting into, like, where you think you're 90% of the way, and then you're like, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's definitely true. Because you're not utilizing the whole the, the layer five and six as much. Yeah, so I so I did end up bumping it to six layers because someone suggested that, and I, I thought that was a ridiculous suggestion. It was going to be too much money, and then I checked, and it turns out it's actually really not that much more money. So, yeah, so, yep, bumped it, bumped to six layers, ended up using, I think I did use some of maybe both of those to route on. So I eventually ended up re I sort of progressively reconnected the LEDs to the controller again and again until I got to a layout that would solve, which left me with a very strange uh, physical mapping, I guess, instead mm -hmm. of a simple physical mapping and a simple logical mapping. So there ended up being a couple layers of mapping in software to map it to the right physical layout to make it so that the LEDs right. were sane to address, which was, I think, the right choice. But in hindsight, if I were to go back and route the board now, I think there are some, I think, I think there is maybe more strategy that could have happened up front that would have let me squeeze it down into four layers or would have let me map it in a more, a more reasonable way requiring less kind of crazy rearranging in software. Uh, yeah. for for the six layers but that, i mean it worked out fine, what actually but. was the so you said it wasn't a driver circuit but what was it just like charlie plexing or what was the actual method of you didn't have 144 pins did you i did not so i ended up using um issi makes like ram and led controllers and their led oh, controllers yeah. are really really dumb and really inexpensive for the number of pins you get and i really like them there are some really incredible ti led controllers that you can write assembly into them and like they have gpios and they are fully functional controllers but those are uh those can be very complicated <laughs> and yeah, quite a right. pain in the butt to deal with so i i much prefer keeping the smarts in the in the microcontroller so i ended up using a 36 channel driver which was quite dumb and then dividing the leds into four banks which uh ended up sort of being distributed north south east west on the board so mm. Let's see. So there was a PFET on the high side and then, yeah, because it was a low side driver. So there was a, a PFET on top and then the LED and then the LED controller on the bottom. So mm -hmm. the strategy ended up being the sort of predictable, like enable a bank, disable the other banks, write to the controller, wait a moment, disable the bank, enable the next bank, rewrite yeah, to the controller, yeah. sort of cycling. Yeah, like round robin kind of idea. And it's just so fast yeah. that you eyeballs don't see it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was that took a few iterations to get to the point where it was as smooth as I wanted it. And it did end up I, I was worried the controller spoke I squared C. And so I was I was kind of worried that I, think I ended up even needing the full megabit. I think I was running it at maybe 400 kilohertz. Uh, mm -hmm. I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to get buttery smooth fades, which is my only goal in life. But uh, <laughs> with, I think a couple a couple rounds of optimization and, and DMA, I think eventually got me there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, and I mean, at that point, you're basically in your in your wheelhouse, and you're doing your uh, your firmware stuff. So right, right, just like 
bringing work home with you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I I have certainly more recently tended towards projects which don't overlap as much with with work yeah. things, just to kind of let the brain change shape a little bit. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about work. So you are doing a lot of firmware stuff, but it's all pretty low level hardware, it seems like. And um, so maybe we can go back to the bumping out of school and, and starting starting into work. What, what was that? What did that look like? Yeah, so I worked at Amazon Lab 126 first uh, out of school, which is the chunk of the company. I guess it's now kind of all amalgamated into one. But at the time, it was the chunk of the company that did the Kindle. And they, mm -hmm. I guess it was just the Kindle and the Kindle Fire at that point. Um, I worked on a funny research project. And then the thing that eventually became the Echo, which was, uh, in hindsight, very neat. At the time, I did not... At the time, it was a, a weird thing that sat on the desk and didn't work super well, so it was not very engaging. <laughs> but in, in hindsight, I guess that turned out to be a pretty decent Yeah, those idea. things are friggin' everywhere now. So, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I saw recently they made it into a ring, too. Yeah. Have so you seen that thing? Um, they're yeah. starting some more exploratory stuff, it looks like. So there's a ring. There are glasses. Um, yeah. There's They finally... So part of the original product vision was sort of a wall wart that would be basically disposably inexpensive that you just throw in all the outlets and oh. all the different parts of your house and then you'd have an ambient computer Star Trek style. And they do finally have that now after mm -hmm. years of iteration. The, yeah. the Echo, shoot, what's it called? The plug one. There's an ugly little wall wart plug one, which oh, I haven't is seen like that 20 one. Okay. bucks. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, it meets that original design goal. I, I've never yeah. seen one in person, but they do exist. One, I think they, one of the things is they started pushing it down into like like chips so that they could also sell to other companies outside of Amazon, which is an interesting yeah. thing. So it's got like the listening engine and the whatever the machine language learning that that yeah. does the, you know, Alexa stuff. So yeah, yeah. The original Echo was, well, it took quite a while to ship. Uh, so it was an OMAP 3. Uh, it was a weird skew of the OMAP 3 with like a funny DSP core attached. Uh, and I think yep. uh, I, I don't really have very many memories of the um, performance thresholds that it was hitting. But at the time, Doing all the all of beamforming and stuff in real time was like a tall a tall order. And nowadays, yeah. that is certainly not the case. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's just it's propagated to lots of different. It's not just Amazon doing it anymore either. It's it's right. damn. It's everything wants to listen to you and it's, right. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, maybe has other implications which were perhaps not as not as clearly foreseen at the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, exactly. It's like a technological thing that you like. I mean, beamforming itself is cool as hell, right? It's in uh, audio, it's in RF, and it's in, you know, it's in, it's obviously like constructive, destructive interference. Like, it's a cool mm -hmm. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe people are less interested in having their stuff listened to all the time. <laughs> are you, <laughs> how, how do you feel about it? I mean, I guess you're, a, you know, you're someone who worked on early versions of it. How, do you have lots of listening devices in your house? That's a good question. I have pretty mixed feelings. I, I guess I'm fairly comfortable having echoes in my house, like at mm -hmm. the time. So it, the, I think they all still have a microphone mute button on them. So at the yeah. time, I like looked at the electrical schematics and confirmed that the microphone mute button like grounded Actually the cuts. microphone inputs yeah. or disconnected yeah. the microphone or something. Right. <laughs> um, Actually, I think originally they were planning on having the button be transparent, so you could like you could see the like mechanical mechanism disengaging. No, it, that obviously <laughs> that wouldn't really have been terribly meaningful, and they didn't end right, up doing that. Right, right. Grandma doesn't care um, about that. So, <laughs> right, yeah. So I guess as a holdover, I still feel comfortable having echoes in my house, and I carry a phone with me, like most yeah, people do. And the phone yeah, includes yeah. a variety of processors, including processors that run software that can't be inspected that you don't know anything about that has DMA access to the rest of the system. So there's kind of a lot of trust implicitly that the sensors on your phone are doing exactly what you think they're doing. Right. right. Um, and I think, I think the other thing too, is like from a, you know, from an ethics point of view too, it's like, even in the best case scenario, like I, I agree to, I don't know, like uh, Google maps. Right. And then mm -hmm. the one that really freaked me out was like, Oh, you know, there's like a pop-up that says, Oh, check out, check out your history. And I'm like, okay. You know, it was like part of like the data thing. And it like literally showed me getting on the train every day and going to work and then coming back. And, oh, no, no, that day, you know, you like cycle back through and it's like, oh yeah, like this thing, like everything tracks everything. Of course it does. Yeah. Right. There's no yeah. surprises here. I'm, I sound, you know, stupid, but like, but when you see it, it's like, oh, okay. That's a nice little <laughs> right. reminder. Yeah. Right. It's very different being intellectually aware that it's happening and then looking yeah. at your location history for the last two years and going, oh yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Tuesday, in September 2017, I, I was, in fact, at that coffee shop. 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, and I think uh, you know, and I guess again to bring it back to current events, right? It that is how China and South Korea are tracking COVID cases, right? It's like that is mm-hmm. something that's in all of our phones, anyways, and it it can be used for you know positive outcomes, but uh, you know, I also think negative. <laughs> Google actually released um, a page this week that yeah, tracks community mobility. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Google.com slash COVID-19 slash mobility, which okay. I think generates that, basically aggregates that data and um, shows you a, shows you information about how much people are moving around you. Let mm-hmm. me see. I haven't actually looked at... Okay, there is one for California. I have not looked at this data. Interesting. How frequently are people at transit stations or workplaces or residential? Yeah. Ooh, by county... Very interesting. Yeah, it's they collect this information. I guess it kind of makes you wonder: is this is this like people who have location history turned on and they're anonymizing it? Is this information location information that's collected via some other means? Um, let's see. A couple of weeks ago, there was a company that published a similar sort of report about mobility i think they were they were rating different regions on like how well they'd done sheltering in place but they unlike google who everyone is aware that google collects this sorts of well many people are aware that google's collect this sorts of information and many people have experienced prompts on their phone asking them ask having google ask them about sharing their location information right this company is one of the companies that that uh, buys that information in bulk from carriers or other sources and then uses it for analyzing like sporting events and marketing performance and stuff like that. So it was a little distressing to see some random company you've never heard of with all this information, <laughs> but yeah. it gets out there. You just don't think about it most of the time. Right. Right. And it, I mean, it feels innocuous most of the time. I mean, it is pretty much like, yeah, okay, I go to CVS, who cares? But then also, uh, okay. You know, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is fun. So you helped enable this. That's cool. Uh- <laughs> yeah, it feels, feels great. <laughs> yeah. Surveillance yeah. state. Yeah. Um, well, you know, an opt-in sort of surveillance thing. I mean, here's the right. thing. I love telling a music thing to tell play jazz. And if I could just tell it to do that and not do anything else, that'd be great, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so And there are there are, you know, open source or offline versions of speech recognition engines and things yeah. that do yeah. that do some of that. It just turns yeah. out that the way they're that it works not best. Twenty dollars. You... you know, they're not right. <laughs> built into things. Right. Yeah. Right, they're not twenty dollars. They're not built into your stove or your microwave. They're yeah, yeah, for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, what what is the so? You, did you work on the OMAP when you were there? Is that the some of the kind of things you worked on? Yeah, I did. Um, I guess like Linux system software things. I don't. Mm-hmm. I amazingly, I, so I still have the device that I got at the time when they were first launched, and it still has feature parity. So there's some. Some unfortunate team of people stuck in a corner working on our weird open embedded OS build <laughs> supporting that strange old processor. Wait, they're, they're pushing updates to your stuff still? I That's amazing if so. I mean, like that's that's wow. So I mean... it had it definitely has the same features as more recent as far as well, excepting excepting hardware things like sensors that don't exist. Uh, I believe it still has the same set of software features that a more recent Echo does. I'm not 100 wow. percent sure, but well, that's really it impressive. Definitely, yeah. It definitely did get things like Spotify playback and and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Right, right. I, I always kind of figured that like on the hardware, it's basically just a processing engine to push to the network. Like when I uh, like I have a Google Home as well, and it just like sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, both of them just kind of sit there and spin if the network's slow, right? I have like mm-hmm. kind of crappy Wi-Fi, and so I I was just figured that there's not like a ton of localized. There are some localized things, of course, right? It's driving speakers, it's handling inputs, outputs, whatever. But like, like you're, it's not pushing like firmware updates to talk to Spotify, is it? I get the uh, thing you're talking actually, about. Actually, Spotify specifically. So I think it I think it ends up being a mixture. Okay. Uh, I can so I guess I can speak to things that were true at the time. I have no idea. If they're true now, and if they're sure, sure, you, enough, you left there and things should five, be cleared, five but, or so years ago or whatever. Yeah, more than that. Um, yeah, yeah, six or seven, I think. So at the time, some, some link or some, let's see, there's natural language processing, and then the actual voice recognition stuff. So some of that happened on board. So like for any of these devices, I assume 
you want them to respond as quickly as possible when you wake them up. So the wake word stuff presumably runs on device. And probably mm -hmm. one or two other things, like the ability to tell it to stop, presumably happen on device because mm -hmm. you want that to be very low latency. Some things are sort of a mishmash. So again, I have no idea how it works now, but sure, sure. the original integration with things like Q was a very strange, it, it didn't happen on, uh, actually, was this the case for Hue? I think it was the case for Hue and maybe some of the like it's, Wemo smart outlet stuff. Yeah, he, used... Hue is a light bulb for people that don't know. It's a Philips light bulb. So. Mm, sorry, yes, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, so there's like the, the Philips Hue light bulb things, which were very early on the scene in terms of home IoT hardware. And there were, was it Belkin makes under the Wemo mm -hmm. brand, That's right. uh, switches and maybe light bulbs and outlets and energy monitors and stuff. So some of those early integrations happened via, I think it was via UPnP on the local network. So oh, really? oh, you wow. would okay. ask her to discover devices and then she would basically <laughs> proxy like UPnP from your local network to the back end and then back down. So you'd like tell her to turn off, turn off a light. And so the wake word would run locally and then voice would stream to the back end where they would do all the recognition stuff and figure out you wanted to turn off a light and they would craft the appropriate message that needed to go out on your LAN and then send that message down to the device. And then the device would relay that message out to your light switch on the LAN. And then you'd also get like streamed back the voice response to your query. <laughs> it's like really? a, a oh, funny wow. mixture of stuff. I always just figured uh, that the light bulbs were like listening on the general network as well and like talking back to the servers. Is that not the case? I think it depends. I, I think oh, there okay. are... In a perfect world, you'd want these things to all be over your local network because you don't want sure, control sure. of your light bulbs to be dependent on an internet connection. Though or at all. in reality, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or yes, <laughs> in reality, I think things are probably not quite not quite so clean. But mm -hmm. there are more recently they've started adding Zigbee, I think, to some models and Bluetooth oh, for yeah. some home IoT stuff. And so in those cases, obviously, there's there's like a local interaction between your device and sensors and actuators that are physically present, physically near it. Mm -hmm. um some things i i think there was originally some funny i think spotify might have happened on device just because of the way their libraries were put together or something but for for the most part I, I think the i would make the same default assumption that you do about most things happen on the back end and get streamed down because why would you like yeah, it, it's right. preferable it's for speed of development and debugging and everything it's preferable to do as little edge compute as possible probably mm -hmm. Well, and I think from a, like you, you're saying with libraries and stuff too, I just, I mean, it may be less of a problem at the beginning, but like as the things open up, you know, you get more and more and more people in the ecosystem. It's like, you don't want to have to be doing like hardware specific calls. You want to have like these genericized inputs or these right. interfaces rather. And yeah, the web is pretty good at that kind of thing, actually. Right. I, I would also assume that most of these, certainly when we were doing it and processing power was a little more limited, it was, it was yeah. a a custom Linux OS built on built with open embedded or eventually Yocto. Um, oh, cool. I, I would okay. guess though that nowadays compute is so inexpensive. These things are probably all running something that looks Android ish. I would mm -hmm. actually Google has a, a weird mishmash of different operating systems. I would assume that all of Amazon stuff is running Android of some flavor, though I have no particular inside knowledge to believe that that's the sure. case. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, interested in this kind of like um when you think about it from a human resources perspective that's one of the things actually really kind of start to get interesting right so it's like you're trying to grow an ecosystem ecosystem and it's like all right we're going to build this thing let's say we're going to like make something like you know you're building out a ecosystem of lights and all these different things and you're like no but everything has to be written in c everything is bare metal <laughs> whatever it's like okay that works great but how many how many engineers are available for that sort of thing and how mm -hmm. smart is that? It's like, you're going to just mm -hmm. run out of engineers before, even if you have these great performance improvements, it's just you're, you you don't have the same amount of engineers available as you might if you take it up a level and you start to make you know it available on a software level with just a bunch of people that know software level things. You know, I just think feel like there's the numbers are way different. Yeah, I um, experienced that at the, so that I guess the next company I worked at, the little engineering consulting company, the last big thing I worked on was one of these kind of dockless shareable scooters that you see around. And I haven't heard about those. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, if you wait another six months, you might not have heard about those. Yeah. Depending well, on what the market continues doing. Yeah, I'm not. I'm okay with that, though. You know. <laughs> <laughs> 
they, the scooters are the that... first thing to go, Carrie. I'm okay with it. You know, like uh, <laughs> very sensitive they... to the San Francisco ecosystem, which apparently is built entirely on scooters. But uh, oh, it, it is know. built entirely on scooters. Yeah, it's yeah, like right. Seattle's built on top of a city underneath. It's in San Francisco. Yeah. It's uh, the city, and then scooters, and then I think ping pong tables from failed startups, and then uh, mud <laughs> at the bottom of the bay. Right. Right. Yep. Today, we're again hearing from Screaming Circuits, this time about how our listeners can optimize their designs for assembly. But we first wanted to give an update on their services. Screaming Circuits are remaining open during the COVID-19 shutdown to help in the fight against coronavirus. Dwayne Benson, who we'll hear from here in a bit, told me over email, quote, We've changed a lot in the factory so that we can keep our employees safe, especially those that work on the production floor, putting parts on your board every day. Any electronics used in diagnostics or treatment of COVID-19 are given priority. It's not an easy thing to do, but people still need their electronics built, end quote. We're glad they're helping people get electronics they need, especially in this time of crisis. We had previously talked to Dwayne about how our listeners can optimize designs for getting board assembly done. Here's what he said. Yes, keeping all the surface mount components on one side is going to be less expensive in most cases. If you have a really sp- a small board, however, you may be able to get the board even smaller by using the double sided. So check with check pricing on the board with the board house as well as with us to see what combination of smaller board ver- with parts on two sides versus larger board with parts on one side is going to be less expensive. Another thing you can do is, um, uh, you know, BGAs, while they're awesome, they do cost a little bit more more money to process. So uh, um, if you if you don't have to, don't use BGAs. And with us, it's a any BGAs is the same as one BGA. Any number of BGAs is the same as one BGA. So it's kind of a yes or no decision because we used to charge per BGA because it cost us per BGA. We x-ray all of them. So there's extra inspection, but we, we kind of average it off and say, okay, if we're x-raying one or two, it costs us about the same. Some people have more, um, but we'll just eat that cost. The other thing is, is that most people or a lot of people don't realize today is if you can go a hundred percent surface mount, that can save you uh, a lot of money as well. Through whole parts are usually either, um, well, for most boards, they're uh, hand inserted. So that takes extra time. A surface mount component will cost a lot less, usually to buy the component and to place the component. So surface mount all, all the way is a good way to save cost. Uh, something else you can do if you've got a lot of components that are similar You know, for example, uh, an I2C pull-up resistor, um, you might have a 4K and, uh, you know, you might have a pull-down resistor for a MOSFET switch that's 5K. If they can both use the same component, use the same component. Surface mount assembly, one of the major charges is each different component costs extra because that's an additional setup stage. So if you can combine parts, do it. Uh, Make sure, of course, it's not an engineered component where you need the exact value. That's something different. But if you need a bunch of 180 ohm resistors for LEDs and the other LED has 220 ohm resistors, check and see if you can use the same part for both. So if you need electronics made for a medical project that can help with coronavirus, be sure to mention that when you order. And check out ScreamingCircuits.com slash The Amp Hour to get your next board quoted for Everyday Electronics. And now back to the show. The company we were working with... This is Mindtribe, in- the company you were at. Yes, you're sorry. The engineering yeah. consulting company I was at is called Mindtribe, was called Mindtribe, I guess. They've been since acquired by, by uh, Accenture. Uh, yeah. so. That's right. And actually, uh, some of the people that worked at Mindtribe now work like a hundred feet away from me because Accenture is working at an M hub and there some of their people mm-hmm. are like, yeah, they bought the mind tribe group. So mm-hmm. unfortunately Carrie didn't come to visit or uh, Fred, who was also, we used to work there that I, I met through you. And uh, I was expecting <laughs> to like know all these people that were going to come to my office and no, no, not anymore. So I think we were, we were hoping that that, that would have been fun. <laughs> the yeah, M, the M yeah. hub space is really incredible. Uh, much yeah. and much more impressive shop space than than our office was. Though our office did did okay given the amount of room available. Sure, to sure. It. I mean, but yeah, that would have been very Chicago very fun versus to come San Francisco. Real estate prices are you know different. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, you were saying Mind Tribe, and you were working for some small. Uh, you were saying they were doing a dockless scooter. Yeah, so one of one of these companies that so they had existed for a while. They had a large engineering organization. They had a, a variety of products already on the market, but 
they didn't have any experience doing hardware because that didn't like <laughs> very orthogonal to the rest of their business. So we did end up, at least for the version of it that I worked on, it's it has since been um, revised at least once. Uh, we did end up using using like a, a a real microcontroller, microcontroller, not not a Linux system. But there was a lot of discussion about it. It, it just feels I don't know. It, it feels kind of <laughs> wrong. It feels wrong to put an entire to coop up an entire Linux computer in in the head of a, a little scooter where it's only <laughs> ever going to need to like actuate three GPIOs and turn on a yeah. light. But there was a lot of discussion about whether or not that was appropriate because they certainly they employed people who could write C but they employed a very large number of extremely skilled engineers who worked on you know the things you find on a server backend so That's right. languages right. like python and javascript yep yeah and and i think a big argument against it normally is batteries but like when you look at like the comparative processing of like a you know micro or even like a small phone on there versus what the battery draw there's huge batteries on scooters so like mm -hmm. it's actually not a bad design decision either you know there's no the, it'd be a small percentage of the total power used so that's not a big deal right and you because it's going to have like a cell modem and stuff that's going to be on all the time yes yeah. yeah. it's going to be on all the time and like all these other things that are going to yeah. be hogs mm -hmm. and the the economics are very very at least at the time were very strange because they weren't this isn't a product they were selling they weren't trying to make a margin on each one they basically actually at the time i <laughs> certainly they wanted it to be reliable they were they were most to, and actually to be clear and to their credit the highest priority through everything was making sure that it was always going to be safe for the user yeah right that's good yeah. besides that like it, it was you know hopefully we'll turn a profit but but their they needed this product because it was an existential threat to them if they didn't have it. That's and right. So right. almost nothing else mattered. It needed to exist, and you needed it like it needed to have a battery, and you needed to be able to ride it. But besides mm -hmm. that, the individual right. it's a branding cost, exercise. Like, <laughs> it's right. crazy, but yeah. Right. Right. Certainly, spending less money is preferable. But if the answer was, well, we need to add another fifty dollars to each unit because we're going to put a Linux computer in there, then the answer was like, okay, that's that's fine. If you need it, that's fine. Uh, mm -hmm. especially if it if it would let you get to market faster that was like the the name of the right. game was how quickly can you ship how quickly can these things be on the streets uh, yeah. and so if if the answer was spending more money on a part then that was fine and they would turn the screws on the suppliers because the volume was going to be super high and see where it ended up yep yep and that's an interesting constraint i think that you deal with more being in the bay area than i ever see in the midwest um you know you're <laughs> you mean, you're i mean all, Functional companies versus dysfunctional companies. <laughs> no, actually, uh, well, I mean, no, uh, I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say that. you can say that, but I wouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> I actually just meant like time to market. I mean, like that is mm. that was a really good point, though, right? I mean, like, yeah, you might be doing a subpar system at, from like a long term perspective, whatever, but like we got to get a thing out there. And I don't think I've ever worked on something that was so quick turn that it was like you know we have to hit market within three months or six months or whatever like you know mm -hmm. it was just you know, throwing throwing money at a problem of course but throwing it a money at a problem that has a a deadline that is very very dr driven by market forces so that's kind of interesting yeah mind tribe the consulting company i i think per hour was fairly expensive and so almost everything we worked on it made the most sense to, to like turn PCBs as quick as possible and turn mechanical prototypes as quickly as possible because that was going to be fewer of our hours and fewer fewer hours overall and that was more money efficient especially because many of many of our clients were efficient were very interested in minimizing time to market or they needed an answer to a question quickly or something and it aligned best with their goals to not to not sit and spin your wheels waiting for PCBs to come back in three right, weeks right. when you could Six turn them in turn. five days. What's the problem? <laughs> You're going to get a great <laughs> right. price on these guys. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So I think that project ended up being four months from start to wow. units rolling off the production line that went onto a real street that people actually rode. Yeah, yeah, that's that's impressive. I mean, we're, we're our Mind Tribe clients mostly. They were kind of like localized to the Bay Area as well, so it was kind of similar kind of MOs towards design constraints and stuff like that of real fast market. Yeah, for the most part, they they definitely were slightly farther afield, but a large a large fraction was was very local to the Bay Area or really to San Francisco. And uh, I don't remember what the breakdown was, but a good chunk ended up being startups where 
the thing that we were working on for them was like that was the company. It wasn't, you know. Yeah, right. We are a hardware company. We're making a big, yeah. It's it's the all around that hardware thing, though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that mean for you as a as a firmware person? Then, so like, uh, so you know, you were working on Linux systems on low level hardware or low, low level code and stuff like that. Like, does that impact you more or less than normal? Like uh, that that fast timeline, or I, I guess were there lots of revs on the hardware side that you had to kind of keep up with? It was definitely really good in terms of exposing me to a large number of different technologies and ways of solving problems. At some point, as a consultant, dealing with the client, dealing with the client is maybe a, a, strong, a, a strong arm way of phrasing it. Being able to <laughs> interact with people, this is actually a, a lesson that I learned at some point, I think, I think mostly at Mind Tribe. Turns out, if you can't communicate about the thing that you're doing, it almost doesn't matter what you're doing at all. So uh, communication with the client and the stakeholder was extremely important. And so I, as a random engineer, all the engineers needed to be able to do things like this, but it was a useful skill to be able to walk into a room and just whiteboard off the top of your head how you might to get put together a system to do X. And so uh -huh. working on a variety of small or small and kind of medium products over a bunch of industries meant that I was forced to bump into a bunch of different kinds of microcontrollers and sensors and vendors and all sorts of stuff. And so I got good at doing that and good at trying to wade into something as quickly as possible. That's great. On tight timelines, it was important to communicate well about what was likely to be done and what was not likely to be done and to try to mercilessly hack away at requirements and things to get to Again, it's important to identify the problem you want to solve and then solve that problem and not the other ones. So it became very important to clearly identify the thing the client was most interested in doing or learning about and then optimizing as much as you could for solving that problem. And then, you know, as much as much flowery, nice gravy on the side as possible. But like you needed to hit whatever the MVP feature set was and anything else was nice to have. And you, that was your job as a consultant, not as like a manager's job. You had to be like, well, if you do this, it's going to add three months. Or how did how did that actually interaction go down? It came from a variety of places, but Mind Tribe was very small and very picky about who they hired, and so the expectation was certainly that individual engineers would would have those conversations with clients as well. I mean, you know, you if there's someone who's really hard to deal with, or there's a lot of sensitivity or something, then then maybe that's not what happened, but. Generally, the engineers were in those meetings and and helped make those decisions. Mm. And so, so it's interesting to me because uh, I had a past job. I worked with some consultants, and uh, they were a bit rude, to be honest. Um, <laughs> they were very, very talented, but they were they were uh, they. I think they felt very comfortable with the scenario they were in, and they very much spoke their mind. They were very strong, you know, strong willed, and like mm -hmm. that stuff, I'm fine with. But the way that they did it was very rude, especially at least from my you know somewhat naive standpoint of it but now on the other side of the equation as a consultant <laughs> i find myself wondering is like oh you know some of the things they were saying were you know smart things i i disagree with how they said it but like mm -hmm. i i'm always curious about how that interaction goes down and uh i i guess I, i'm wondering if you were empowered to do that as well that and it sounds like you were i think so yeah I, yes like i would i would say that i was there's definitely I, I guess, as, as you have probably experienced, there's sort of sometimes some, not really cross purposes, but if you're paying someone to be a consultant, you want to feel like you're, like you're paying them because they're, you feel, they convinced you that they were an expert at this thing and they could help you solve this problem. And so part of that is like showing your expertise <laughs> because yeah, you right. like, you need it to every new, every new client, you have to convince that you are in fact, not like a talking doorknob and you, you do, <laughs> you do actually know what you're doing and you're worth paying. So right. there's, I, I have definitely had this maybe doesn't directly answer your question, but I've certainly had lunches and, and stuff with clients where I was very intentional about telling like strategic war stories in order to encourage them that I did in yeah. fact know what I was doing. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I think that's, and I think that's the right, I don't know what I'm actually getting at here other than to say that 
the consultants I worked with and my, my past were kind of a-holes and I'm, I don't, I know, I know you and you're not an a-hole. And so I was just kind of curious oh, about what your experience was like. So it sounds like that's, the, that is the way to do it though. Right. It's like talking about past experience is good. I think mm-hmm. right. proving your point, showing your work, that kind of thing is, sounds like stuff you're doing. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's so I, I work at a tiny startup now and yeah. I, in some ways being, working as like a consultant for this sort of small hardware stuff was great preparation. And in other ways it was not. <laughs> so, okay. So let's hear what are, what are the differences? Uh, ooh, I think I, cause you are the lead firmware engineer of span.io. We should say that here. Um, that is, I guess that's true. But at the smallest, if it, depending on how small this company, if it's like four people, it's like, yeah, well, Carrie is the firmware guy. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Well, right. Yeah. So I, I was number six. Uh, I was the first person hired to do software on the device. So yes, I was the lead, uh, hey. because I was the primary person. And so there was he's, no one else to do that work. He's the guy, you know, he's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a, that nice, uh, title inflation startup benefit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you should change it to VP of firmware. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, when I started, I, I did actually push a little bit on that title envelope and this is where things ended up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I guess I thought that I was good at at hacking away at all the things that weren't absolutely critical to the product. But I think working at a tiny company where I have all of the skin in the game instead of some of the skin has oh, definitely yeah. made it clear that I, it, in some cases as a consultant, there's some amount of process that you, you like really need sort of as a, almost a defensive shield. Like you, you really do need to do very, I don't say careful planning, but you can you can get shafted if people aren't all on the same page about what you're building and why you're building it and what it's going to mm-hmm. do. And so you spend a lot of time where I found myself spending, there's like a, a process for producing, not exactly spec documents, but sort of like requirements documents and feature lists and stuff like that. And, you know, depending on the client, you do more or less of that. But in I when I started at this company, I definitely felt uncomfortable with the level of planning and eventually i kind of or the level of i don't know too too little or too much too i guess i was worried that that like i was not building the right thing or i wasn't sure if i was building the right thing and eventually i kind of figured out that like the company is very small we sit at one table like we're oh. building the right thing because we constantly talk to each other about what we're building. We don't like that doesn't require documents to be produced and Jira tickets to be filed. You, you can just, you should just talk to a person and then figure it out and it'll be fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying this is, yeah, I guess true. Yeah. If you're coming out of school to lab 126, which has grown, I don't know how big it was when you joined it, but like that and then mind tribe, it sounds like you've kind of been going to smaller and smaller companies over time. Yeah. Yeah. Lab was, I, think around the thousand to 1500 yeah um, i don't remember so how there's large a process Amazon there because time. you have to have it you don't you're not sitting here that would be a friggin' big table to sit around and it would be very loud <laughs> to talk right. about specs right um, right yeah yeah and that was i think that was one of the things that eventually caused me to to decide to leave lab was was i i felt like i was too far removed from the people making kind of product user related mm-hmm. decisions which i don't think was unreasonable at all given that i was a fresh out of school engineer working right, on the software right. of some random component of the system but yep. Yep. uh certainly being the person writing the software for the device at a startup um <laughs> remove that <laughs> there is no insulation <laughs> yeah yeah well it's interesting too it's like i've i've talked to some friends and you know colleagues and people on the consulting forum and similar things and uh I'm always interested people. It, it, it seems like a common theme of like, I want to have more agency. I want to, I want to be, they don't always say in charge, but they, they, I want to have impact on decision-making, right? It sucks to be removed from everything like you're talking about and just being told what to do like that. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to, you want to have skin in the game, like you're saying, but the interesting twist is that some people then say, I want to be a manager. And mm-hmm. I have never felt that, but I think it's because I didn't, I, I moved away from moving away from the technical stuff usually makes me feel worse. And it's like, I think going smaller is actually the right, you know, you don't get necessarily get to work on as, as big of projects. Right. So mm-hmm. if you want to stay and work on a engine, at GE, it's like, yeah, you're going to be a manager at some point because you just, you want to make an impact and do some new thing with an engine. It's like, yeah, that's tens of thousands of people work on that. But mm-hmm. if you want to work on a thing that's sm- you go to something smaller, like you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably a good way of, 
I guess it's really like a multi-dimensional curve or gradient yeah, right, uh, right. between like company size and product complexity and, and org yeah. size and where you have to sit in the org to feel like you're holding, holding onto the reins sufficiently. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to be clear, I do now have coworkers who are, who are also working on device software stuff. So I, I certainly cannot take credit for, for everything that, that exists now. Uh, mm. And they might well, you're, yeah, this, you're, you're, this podcast, so I don't want to. You're, you're the lead, man. You have to have other people there if you're the lead. That's so, the lead software. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, you're the you're the principal of um, of Analog Life, right? <laughs> yeah, you should see all of my the hordes of people that I I command. You know, mm -hmm. many yeah. many people. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's depending on the amount of control you want and the complexity of the product and the size of the company. It's possible that if you it, I can I I also had trouble empathizing with that position, but now I can sort of see that at some point the trade off you make is if you want to have a larger impact on the business, the way that you do that is by moving up the chain away from the technical work because those probably aren't the people who need to be in the room when some decisions are being made. So like if you want control over non technical decisions, you have to do that by going up, not um, deeper. I guess. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. You were you were kind of talking about like the you were kind of like talking about MVP and, and stuff like that. I, I still don't quite understand what you were saying about the, you you were saying the skin in the game thing and that makes sense, mm -hmm. but what has changed now for you? Like you're saying that you, you were worrying too much and you've tried to scale it back and just write code now, or you're saying you've, you were worrying too little and you were, you have start you dove, dove into more planning. I think it's more like, and this is, this is certainly still something that I'm, I'm working on striking the right balance of, but I think it's there's a skill, perhaps a skill that comes with experience, in knowing when you should push back and really, you know, make sure you get the architecture right, and when uh -huh. it matters considerably more that you just implement the thing and then ship it, and you're going to learn so much more by actually shipping the thing and having someone try using it than you are by sitting and polishing the design for two weeks. And it's see. it's difficult. As a, as a consultant, often there were relatively clear deliverables. And so it was like, spend as much, like, you're going to work on this thing. So we're going to design the thing, and then we're going to build the thing, and then we're going to deliver the thing. But right. in this context, <laughs> there's a product that we're trying to ship. And the only thing that matters to the company is like, generate revenue, ship <laughs> product, improve right. product. So whatever yeah. you do needs to and needs to go towards that end. So if if you need to spend some more time polishing to make sure something is safe or reliable or is going to work great for the next 10 years, then that's absolutely worth doing and you should do it. But if you're, if you're working on like making sure you're dividing your software module appropriately, then like maybe you don't need to think about that for more than five minutes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that actually, I think what it, it sounds like to me is like, it's how you're getting paid. Right. So like as a consultant, you're getting paid by the deliverable, which is the thing. It's like you point to it, it's like, mm -hmm. hey, there's the thing. I delivered it, you know? And mm -hmm. like what you're saying is now you're talking about like experience and yeah, you need to deliver a thing that works, of course, but it's also, there's a lot of other inputs, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a good way of phrasing it. Yeah. Uh, what is span? I guess we should probably talk about what that is real quick. <laughs> you don't it's already nice we know. talk about like all these things, nice and, you know, soft skill of talking about things, but what right. what are you actually building? Yeah, so... Let me try to do this in a way that doesn't sound like a pitch loop. So Span is building a home electrical panel, a home breaker panel, a load center, depending on what name you know it by, the thing that your circuit breakers sit in. Mm -hmm. It is specifically designed for people who are using storage with solar, which is to say batteries probably with solar. Mm -hmm. So right now, if you you like go to the Tesla website and you... See the, you see the power wall and you think that looks nice and you put your credit card in the machine and you spend $30,000 or something, what you get isn't just the one box that you see on the website. What you get is a whole bunch of boxes. So the, the, the power wall is actually sort of an outlier in some ways. But if you get um, a, if you get like battery plus solar, you often end up with maybe six of these gray sheet metal boxes on the wall that all get conduited together and then attached to your your home electrical system. And it turns out that even though the batteries and the hardware are expensive, you often end up spending more money on electrician time installing yeah. it and wiring it up <laughs> together and commissioning it than you do on the hardware itself, which is pretty wild. Yeah. So Span integrates a bunch of those things together into one bigger box and then also adds a bunch of layers of monitoring and control on top of it, which make it 
much more pleasant to live with battery storage. Mm. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I remember when learning about solar panels themselves, I was like flabbergasted. It's like, yeah, the cost of the the you know the actual PN junction wafers that you're sticking a solar panel are important, but like, damn, that glass and the mounting and the <laughs> you know the micro inverter, the inverter, like all that other stuff, it like really adds. It's not just silicon. You know, there's a lot of other costs in there to get right to get the juice Probably. out. So. Probably an important lesson about the uh, realities of of business. <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's yeah, yeah. That's that's the everything else. Um, that sounds yeah. really cool. Um, and so yeah, kind of similar hardware-y kind of stuff. And we 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 can't talk too much about it, I think, because of the you know it's a current employer. But it sounds like uh, it's got some computing in there and some smarts. So sensors, you said, right? Yeah, this is all. This industry is is totally new to me. I my background is mostly in consumer electronics, so. I have had to do a lot of learning very quickly about yeah. what the industry looks like and the, even the right words to use and things like high voltage safety because now the prototype that's sitting on my desk at home has like a 240 volt AC power supply and some other uh, yeah. stuff attached to yeah. it. Well, and like you're talking about the deliverables too, like that, I mean, safety, like you said, reliability, that stuff is all mm -hmm. really important, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. It, it mattered a lot for the scooters, though the expected lifespan of the scooters was relatively short. It matters a lot more for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess if you're what t house house installation time spans now, or or I guess at least solar solar mm -hmm. plus battery installations are what twenty years kind of thing. Right. Yeah, I don't know what we are officially warrantying, but it's definitely in that kind of order of magnitude, whatever the real yeah. number is. Right, right, right. Does that change your uh, sourcing stuff? Like, so are you? Um, so one one thing I felt in the industrial space has been like, yeah, ten years, no. You know, of course, why wouldn't you design for 10 years? And yet putting in a Linux computer for 10 years, it's like, oh, uh, <laughs> maybe we should make this swappable. Because <laughs> Right. Yeah, like, we, we were just know, talking like, about the Echo, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Well, and yeah, so then you're, you're basically creating technical debt for yourself and something that has to, you know, you're going to update for however many years or whatever. And so it, you're, it kind of grows exponentially in terms of builds you need. But then I think just from a sourcing perspective, just pure hardware sourcing, you know, either you buy them all up front and you got to stock room of 10 years worth or you get an agreement that says they'll make it for 10 years or you know you're, you're switching it out at some point and you have to like maintain multiple versions so like mm -hmm. how are you dealing with that i guess i'm not the right person to answer that question i i think oh, okay. my the shorthand answer is choosing components that are sufficiently overrated so that as they you know things like capacitors mm -hmm. and stuff so that as they degrade over time after thermal cycles and, and years oh sure they they still perform uh sufficiently I, I don't think I have a useful comment on the supplier side stuff. Yeah, no, I actually, I, I just meant like the, 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 just thinking purely in the horsepower of like, okay, so mm -hmm. like, I'm going to use an example so you don't have to tell me what's actually going on in there. But <laughs> say, say you're building, like we talked about earlier, right? You're building something with Android for whatever reason, right? I don't think you are, but let's just use it. And you're on Android 9 and, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be on Android 90 or whatever it is, right? And it's just like, so supporting that and then also having the hardware that's underneath and, and that kind of thing, like, does that mean that you have to do all, like, do you just jump ahead and you're like, okay, we're gonna do all custom at that point? Or does it change your design constraints significantly, including on the firmware side? It definitely changes them some. It, it would be it would be really nice to consider it to be a dumb piece of hardware and then right, you yeah. ship it with whatever set of features it has. And as long as those features never change, you're never gonna need more horsepower. But that's not right. that's not reality. That's not the product. Um, I don't. I don't think that's. I doubt anyone thinks about a, a sort of programmable network connected thing in that in that way. Right. So there definitely has been some work that's gone into making sure that it will the all the the stuff that's difficult to change, which is to say the things that are like literally screwed into the side of someone's house, will last for as long as they need to last, and the stuff that doesn't need to last that long can be swapped so it can stay a little more current. So. There are certainly are components of our product that have been strategically chosen so that they can be, and the product has been physically designed in such a way that some of it is easy to field service and swap out. So yeah. that we don't have yep. to worry about that, you know, that Android 18 to 19 update really, yeah. really breaking us. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then you have a technician that goes out, pops out the old thing, but th this is exactly what I was d discussing and, and dealing with is like, do you basically designing for swappability that's I, it's not a real term but like just that kind of idea i guess service designing for service that kind of thing mm -hmm. um in the industrial space it kind of feels like that's a important thing mm -hmm. that's yeah certainly keeping that in mind is important here 
Um, we also, we're in sort of an interesting position where we have two customers. One customer is the homeowner who's going to live in the house for a long time and needs to be able to use the product and we want to enjoy it. The other uh -huh. customer though is installers. So typically something like oh. this, and really most of a home solar system isn't, you don't like go to Home Depot and buy the pieces and drive it home in your minivan. You call someone who comes to your site and like inspects it and then quotes you a system, which includes a bunch of integrated components. Um, and those people are solar installers. So the product needs to be, it needs to be, <laughs> I guess delightful is probably a good word, a cheesy, but good word to use. Mm -hmm. Part of part of the point, though, is that it makes it easier for solar installers to do their job. It's, it is a more yeah. pleasant experience to install. It's a more pleasant experience to set up. It saves them from, from some things that are big headaches. So, yeah. for instance, one of the things you can do with our product is, and, and this is a totally... This is this is to, this is totally dumb, but you can change the Wi-Fi network over cell. So, like the homeowner can open their app and plug in Wi-Fi credentials, which is a, a totally that to to me that seems like a not quite a nothing feature, but it seems obvious and unremarkable. But the alternative, like they don't have to many connect cases, to a, a access point and then and then figure out which access point they're on and all that other stuff, right? You're just saying it's kind of automagical. Right. It's not a magical, but it's it's actually even worse than that. There are products on the market today where the answer is, you know, you your solar stuff is on the outside of your house. You probably don't think about it unless you have an outage. In the case of like storage, you're probably not really thinking about it unless you're either a super geek, which is definitely a thing that people people who are really interested in, in clean tech absolutely. Dave Jones buy has multiple and... videos about his solar system. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and I can certainly empathize with that. Um, after having spent uh, a lot of time IOTing everything I could in my house, most homeowners, and and certainly as this becomes mainstream technology, which I, I think is my expectation, you don't think about it. It's like on the side of your house, and once a year you have a power outage, and you remember you have it, and that's great. So when you change your router because your internet is slow, you don't think about the fact that your Wi-Fi doesn't work anymore. Oh, and then six months yeah. later, you open your app, and you're like, boy, I can't see how much house how much power my house is drawing, and you don't know what's wrong. And so you call your solar installer and then your solar installer has to do a truck roll and then they have to use like the special professional installer commissioning app, which the homeowner doesn't have to put the, the solar inverter or something's gateway into the special setup provisioning mode and then like ask the homeowner for their Wi-Fi credentials and then stand there outside and plug in their Wi-Fi credentials. So that like torpedoes half a day of time that, that that person could be using to install a new solar system, which generates profit. Instead, right. they have to do a truck roll to update Wi-Fi credentials, which is just like totally, just totally doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. So the, so the you're saying that's that's the old way of it happening. And now the new way is they just do it themselves. And that is a time saver, money saver, whatever. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I was, let me try to pop pop a few layers off the stack and remember how we ended up in this diversion. Well, you know, we were talking about the uh, the installers. So you said there's two. There are two uh, two customers. Right. One's two a customers. homeowner. One's an installer. Yeah, right. and that's an interesting point too about the the installer because actually I have a childhood friend who does this stuff, which is interesting, and I get to hear some of the business side of things too. And like he they they don't have just one product that they sell. You know, they mm -hmm. they sell whatever. There's, you know, a range of services. They're quoting multiple different options, whatever. And mm -hmm. yeah, they, so not only are you, they're one of your customers because you, you want to delight the the installer as a customer, you want to be a better solution because they're, they'll just sell something else. And instead, you know, like you need to be the thing that like, they're like, oh yeah, no, you should definitely use the span IO box instead of the, the right. gray box that has all this other stuff. So, right. yeah. Right. We want them to think it's cool. So they recommend it anyway, but we also want them to to prefer it because it's much faster and easier for them. And so they're more inclined to quote it into a system. And there's, I mean, that there's a lot of business strategic stuff around that, I think, which is sort of out of, out of my, out of my immediate wheelhouse. But that rolls back into features that you end up having to put into the device. So that's kind of interesting. Right. So speaking of serviceability, there are a bunch of layers. One layer of serviceability is the homeowner being able to debug a unit. The next layer of serviceability is our service techs or our engineers being able to remotely help debug a unit when a customer calls or to be able to preemptively detect that there's a problem and either help the homeowner fix it or sort of be be ready to reach out and help them fix a problem and then there's how do we how do our service techs boots on the ground 
physically solve a problem or debug something. And then there's like, what is the electrician going to do when it's the end of the day and it's raining and they're outside and they just want this job to be done and they need to throw it on the wall <laughs> as fast as they can? How do we make it as easy as possible for them? And then how do we make it very hard for them to do it wrong? Yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah. Like, uh, for lack of a better word, dummy proofing. I mean, like usually mm -hmm. that's me, the dummy, but, um, yeah, dummy proofing <laughs> is so it, it like, it pays dividends, you know, like it's like people think like, oh, well, it's an expert system. You want to make it expert, but it's like the more you can simplify it, that pays off in terms of, you know, service hours mm -hmm. multiple, multiple, multiple times. So, yep. There, there are lots of people who are users of your product and you should consider as many of them as possible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, speaking of uh, things that have lots of users, you are also a uh, former, maybe current uh, writer for Hackaday. You have many readers. <laughs> current, though, if you if you ask Mike, um, he, he he would probably shake his fist angrily at me. But oh, uh, yeah. yes, he, he does that. <laughs> <laughs> and you were the uh, the KiCad consultant or the uh, the writer for about KiCad a lot too. <laughs> I guess so. that's true. It did end up well, happening. I, I have a I have a story for you, Carrie. There's a KiCad just has its first uh, um, Altium importer, so. Oh really? Yeah, Ooh. that's a big one. Yeah, so it's wow. very, very rough. But it's uh, t uh, Thomas, I think, who did it. But it's um, yeah, it's I, I saw it on Twitter, and um, wow, it's in the it's in the developer branch now. So that's kind Ooh. of exciting. Oh wow, it's baked into KiCad. It's not it's not a uh, a plugin or something. It's someone else's shipping. That I mean, it was a plugin, but then it yeah, it got rolled into the mm -hmm. into the source. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that I mean, that could be a big one, you know. I mean, that, that without question will be a big one. I assume it doesn't require something cheesy like an Altium installation or something, right? It's, <laughs> right, it's totally right. standalone. What you do is you pay $10,000 and then you, uh, yeah, you can basically, you know, spit out this thing. No, I think it uh, right. somehow they reverse the for file format or something. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder how stable the format is. I wonder if that's, if that's something that you can sort of like reliably do into the future. Yeah. I don't know. You should write an article about it, though, man. So, I, well, yeah. Now that you've now that you've told me about it, I certainly will. Yeah, you can even like roll in the what we talked about in this episode. And you can like put it in there, and you know, it's great. <laughs> it just writes itself. Yeah, guerrilla marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so uh, what what do you like writing about when you do write, Mister oh, Author? Man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, this is kind of cool. The inner workings of a PCB. That one's neat. That was a really cool, a very impressive YouTube video. I don't, I don't know. PCBs definitely seem like, well, like like many things, like a laser cutter, things that seem like magic until you understand how they work. PCBs mm -hmm. are very magical until you realize that they're actually just wires that are flat, and then they're not as magical anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we'll link in all your uh, all of your articles if you don't have any that are like on the top of mind. It's okay. Man, I'm trying to think of stuff that I that I was have been excited to to write up recently. I, I've been looking at embedded device file systems. I think I mm -hmm. did maybe one or two, and I think I had a couple more in the pipe that I was, that I was thinking about because in the vein of compute becoming inexpensive, it's really easy to get a little blob of, of Norflash or something and stick it on a board. And then mm -hmm. the kind of old school way of dealing with it is to manually, and bit bang is the wrong word, but manually sort of bit bang your files onto the disk. But it's really, it's really preferable to use an actual file system with actual directories and stuff. And so, yeah, or, yeah. and you, you can certainly try to use something like FAT, but it's, there are a bunch of file systems which are purpose built for embedded devices, which support, you know, not using a dynamic allocator, which support the right sort of wear leveling and, and power loss tolerance and stuff. Uh, and those are, it's like a neat, a neat thing to have in the tool belt so that, you know, you can reach for it instead of rolling your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. There's multiples of them though. You're saying there's multiple like ways to do that. Yeah. I think the, the, the one that was most interesting that I'm using at work is called little FS, which I think I did. I did actually write it for Hackaday, which was or was originally is is still part of the arm embed project so it is actually developed by arm and has oh, really cool. really wonderful detailed documentation about how it works including great ascii diagrams of um, blocks in the file system and, and all sorts of things as well as ports to a bunch of different languages including like javascript so if you go to there oh. you go to the like github page somewhere in there there's a link to a JavaScript demo that lets you play with the different wear leveling and block size parameters and stuff and, and sort of visualize how long your file system will last, which is very mm. cool. Yeah, that's really cool. 
it also I, I think there's a there's a fuse module so you can if you formatted like a flash drive or something in it you could mount it on a desktop system um, there's a lot of good stuff that's great that's great yeah i found the article too it's called uh cool tools a little file system that keeps your bits on lock mm-hmm. so yeah we'll, we'll link right. that in yep cool well any uh, any last things we should know about you carrie because we've covered a, a wide span of your career so far I have anything in particular i'm i'm looking into getting a laser cutter for i so i just moved I, mm. I went through the process of well trying to iot everything in the house and now i'm kind of figuring out what things should go in the lab space that i now have so i'm i'm finally i think going to pull the trigger on a laser but i haven't mm. figured out i haven't i haven't figured out whether i'm going to go uh chinese budget laser plus mods or glowforge or um, one of the other various options, but mm-hmm. I don't. Yeah, like I don't used, have a good answer for that. Use full spectrum or something like that, or something on eBay. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. The Chinese stuff is just so attractively priced, but I, I think the question is sort of: Do I want to use the laser, or do I want the laser to be yeah, a project? That's right. Is it a project? <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, I think the other question is: uh, If one of the things that I've moved towards is like, if the thing will hold its value. So, like, say you bought like a a decent, you know, l- low end thing that's not like the the cheap you need to mod it if it'll hold Mm -hmm. its value there's there's lower i i for a long time i never thought about the resale of the thing but um i've kind of started moving towards that because it's like okay well first off it it goes on my my company books is like something that i have to depreciate anyways and like there's actual value there but also Mm -hmm. like there's just less risk i can just i can just sell it on ebay and you know yeah i take a loss of some amount but not all of it. it's not like all or nothing so that's a really good point uh and i would expect I would expect that, especially in the case of a laser, a higher end laser from a known manufacturer. I certainly, having browsed uh, used Apple logs and stuff, they hold their yeah, value right. remarkably well. <laughs> right, right, exactly. It's like, I'm not buying one of those. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, you could rent it out to people too or some, you know, just make yeah, a business out of it a, if you want. <laughs> that's a, 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 dangerous, a dangerous and good idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck with that. Uh, hope, uh, hope the new lab works out well. Thanks. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I know we all have time to be in our home labs for now. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it is really, really, I think I've been to the hardware store every weekend uh, with an increasing pile of different projects and things around to, yeah. uh, to work on. Great time for uh, housework. <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Kerry. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Sounds good.